Today we're going to be talking about springs. Now there are two kinds of springs, springs you stretch and springs that you compress. The type of springs that we're going to be working with today are strings that you stretch. So this one here has a resting length of about uh, 19 centimeters or so, and then when I stretch it, it gets longer. We have another spring, this one over here. This little one has a resting length of about 13 centimeters. Okay, so we're going to talk about spring force to start off with. Spring force is the force required to stretch a spring, or the force that a spring exerts when it is stretched or compressed. Again, we're working with the type of spring that you stretch. So I've got a spring scale here to measure how much force it's going to take to stretch this thing. We're going to stretch it about 10 centimeters. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to try and keep the start at zero. So it had a resting length of about 19. I'm stretching it to 29. And you can see that that gives us a force of about four and a half newtons. Four and a half to five, something like that. Okay, so this spring, in order to stretch it 0.1 meters, takes four and a half newtons. So in order to stretch it one meter, it would take 45 newtons. Okay, so this spring has a spring constant, it's called, of 45 newtons per meter. Now let's try our other spring. It has a different spring constant. Whoa! So we're going to hook it up the same way. Start it at zero. I'm going to stretch it 10 centimeters. You can guess. Is it going to have a larger spring constant? It takes more force to stretch it that far. Or is it going to have a smaller spring constant? It's easier to stretch it that far. It takes less force. Here we go. So we're starting at zero, and then I'm going to stretch it. Oh boy. So I've, I've managed to stretch it before my spring scale um, bottoms out. I've managed to stretch it one centimeter <laughs> instead of 10 centimeters. Uh, and that costs me about 19 newtons of force. Okay, so 19 newtons over one centimeter is 1900 newtons per meter, right? Hopefully that math works out right. So this spring has a much higher spring constant than my other spring does, which means it takes more force to change its length, whether that's stretching in the case of these springs or compressing in the case of another spring. So we're going to look at Hooke's Law, which describes that relationship between force and stretch. So Hooke's Law describes that relationship between the amount of stretch or compression of a spring and the force required to do that. Or it could also describe the amount of force that the spring exerts on you when you stretch it or compress it that much. But Newton's third law says that those two things should be the same anyway. So we get force, I'm going to make it fs, spring force, is equal to negative kx. Okay, this can be written a few different ways, but this is the most common one. And so here's what we have in this formula. This fs is spring force, Now this is not this is not a specific kind of force really. It's not its own special force. It's still just a pushing or a pulling force being exerted by a spring in this case. Okay? And that's in newtons as always. This k here this is the spring constant. So this is it's basically how stretchy or compressy that, that doesn't seem quite right. It's how difficult it is to stretch or compress a spring. It's the stiffness of the spring. That's probably better. So the spring constant 
is the stiffness of the spring. I really do like the word compressi though, so we may keep that. This last part here, x, this is the distance stretched or compressed. Distance stretched or compressed. There we go. Whew. Okay, now there's this curious piece over here. There's a negative. So let's just think about what's happening with the spring and the force here. So let's say we have, who cares what the stiffness is, but we are, we're stretching this spring. When we stretch the spring a certain distance, the force that is needed to get it to stretch that far would be in the same direction as the stretch. So if I'm stretching it this direction, the force that's required to get it to stretch that far is in the same direction. So the displacement or the stretch, the distance change, is in that direction. So is the force exerted to make it do that. But what we've got in Hooke's law is actually the opposite. When I have stretched it this far, the force that the spring is exerting on me is the other direction, that way. And so what the negative in the formula says is that the force that the spring exerts when it is stretched or compressed is in the opposite direction compared to the, the distance stretched or compressed. This just specifies that Fs is the force exerted by the spring. So you don't actually need to keep that negative in the formula depending on the situation. So if the question is asking you how much force is required to stretch a spring so and so far, then that negative is not really what you want there because the negative tells you what force the spring is exerting on you, not what force are you exerting on the spring. Okay, so you have to think about what's the subject of the, of the problem. Now, when a spring is stretched or compressed, it has energy stored in it, potential energy. So when I stretch out this spring, like this, you know that when I let go, it's going to fling itself back that way, right? So I'm storing energy in it that gets converted to kinetic energy when you let go. Just like how when you raise something above the ground, it is having gravitational potential energy stored in it, that when you let it go, it then converts that gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy when it falls to the ground. The same thing happens with springs. So we can make a force displacement graph for a spring, force displacement, this is the stretch or compression, amount of stretch or compression. And if you pull on a spring, you'll notice that the amount of force goes up with the amount of stretch or compression. That hopefully is obvious, but it goes up in a linear manner, it turns out. So if we were to figure out uh, the area of this curve, straight line, it's not really a curve. If we were to figure out the area of this, that would be force times displacement divided by two, right? Because this is going to be a triangle. And so the area of this thing is force times displacement divided by two. So the area of this, if you remember way back with the first time that we did force displacement graphs, the area is equal to the work done. Okay. And so in this case, the work is equal to the base times the height divided by two. That's the area of a triangle, right? And in our case, the base is how much stretch or compression there was. So that's x, okay? The height is the force that was required to do that. So that's x times f divided by two. Okay, now we know from Hooke's law above that 
The force we're talking about here is spring force. So then we're doing work is equal to x times kx divided by 2. So notice that I, I didn't put the negative in here. Okay, remember that the negative is how much force the spring is exerting on you when you stretch it. Um, I want how much force is required to stretch the spring or compress the spring a certain distance. And so I've left the negative out of there. Okay, so then what we end up with, if we uh, clean this up a little bit, we've got x times k times x again divided by 2. We end up with half, that's the divided by 2 part, times k times x squared. Okay, so that's the work done in order to stretch a spring a certain distance. But assuming that at the beginning the spring was not stretched at all, that means that we're going from a change of zero joules to this. Okay, remember that work is change in energy. So it's final spring energy minus initial spring energy. But the, and the initial spring energy was zero joules because it wasn't stretched or compressed at all. And so instead what we get is this is final spring energy. And so we can just say that the energy stored in a spring is half kx squared. And we'll put that in our box over here so we can make sure that everything is nice and clean. Spring energy equals half k x squared. So we've added one more type of energy to our conservation of energy system. Okay, so the initial energy is always equal to the final energy. Previously where we were working with just kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. Now we're also adding spring potential energy to that. And so energy at the beginning equals energy at the end, and now we need to split up our energies into kinetic plus gravitational plus spring. Okay, all those things at the beginning are going to be equal to all those things at the end. EG2 plus E s2. It's just that the distribution will have changed. So how much of each is going to change from beginning to end, but the total should stay the same unless some external work is done. So here's our example. A horizontal pinball machine, pinball machines can't really be horizontal, right? Then if you flung the ball away, it would never come back. So we're just, we're honestly just trying to avoid putting gravitational potential energy in there as well, okay? So, uh, of course, that's unlikely. Has a spring with a spring constant of 450 newtons per meter. If the spring compresses 15 centimeters and the mass of the ball is 25 grams, what is the maximum velocity of the ball? So we compress the spring 15 centimeters, and then we, when we release the spring, it speeds up the ball until maximum uncompression until it's reached its maximum length again and then the ball will continue at that velocity. Okay so what we're trying to figure out is what's the velocity of the ball at the end of the extension of the spring. Okay so what we end up with is E1 equals E2 conservation of energy. Spring potential at the beginning turns into kinetic energy at the end. ES is equal to EK, or ES1 is equal to EK2. So half kx squared is equal to half mv squared. So we can simplify this a little bit. We don't need the halves because they are on both sides in each term. So we can just work with that, kx squared equals mv squared. Then we'll rearrange this because we're trying to solve for v. 
So v is going to be equal to the square root of kx squared over m. Okay, we divide by m and then take the square root. So v equals the square root of k is 450 newtons per meter. x is 0 0.15 meters squared. We just had to take that 15 centimeters and change it into meters because that's what's required in our formula, 0 0.15 meters. And then divide that by the mass of the ball, which is 25 grams or 0 0.025 kilograms. Okay, we had to take this 25 grams and divide it by 1,000 to change it into kilograms. So that gets us 0 0.025 kilograms. Square root all that, and what you end up with is V equals 20 meters per second. That's pretty fast.